we can great wonderful yeah so so mark thanks for for inviting me uh it's a great pleasure to 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 deliver the talk that you thought would be helpful which is hot topics in uh sti so i um I'm going to cover three things. So given that bearing in mind, this is mainly an infectious disease meeting. So I was going to talk about MPOX from, from really the sexual health perspective. Doxypep, which is a really big uh, challenging issue for us to deal with at the moment. And then some, hopefully we'll get some time to talk about vaccines to prevent Neisseria gonorrhea infection at the end. So let's talk about MPOX first. So the global situation, as I'm sure most of you are aware, is that you know we had a big um, outbreak in 2022, but it's really sort of petering away now, and uh, the weekly case numbers have declined. The uh, the worst week was in August, starting August the 8th, 7,576 cases, and as you know, the most of them are MPOX are clay two, and the majority of the outbreak was in the Americas uh, and the European region, so. The recent situation has changed somewhat. So in the last uh, 12 weeks up to the 28th of May, there was an average of about 123 weekly cases at the global level. And most of the, the most uh, affected WHO regions remain the Americas. But interestingly, the Western Pacific and Africa are now sort of in second and third pole position. And it seems to have really uh, petered out in, in, in the European setting. And we certainly have only seen a couple of cases this year in Australia. Um, I'm not sure if you'll all be aware, but uh, there was a meeting of the, uh, the fifth meeting of the International Health Regulations Emergency Committee on multi-country outbreaks of MPOX on the 10th of May. And at that point, the, the WHO Director General listened to the advice from the committee and uh, agreed that the MPOX outbreak no longer constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. And so there were revised temporary recommendations issued. Now, during the MPOX outbreak, there was a, a lot of work to sort of educate the, the community and WHO produced a lot, a lot of very useful uh, documents. Uh, and you can see here as well that some of the stuff from Australia and then the UK National Health Service uh, below that. Um, so because of obviously majority of the, the people affected were getting bisexual men, um, it was really important to get the right sort of message to the right sort of communities. But what was very interesting, I think, at the very beginning of the outbreak was the, the stigma and discrimination issues that emerged very quickly. And I guess it's because, you know, you know um, more than 95 percent of the, the people affected by this outbreak were gay, bisexual men, predominantly in the 30 to 40 year old age group. And up to half of the people affected were actually living with uh, HIV. And among the HIV negative group, about 80% were taking PrEP. And, and it really became like the new AIDS. It was quite fascinating. Even my own hospital, some of the consultants there um, and other medical specialists were talking about it in this very, I could, quite discriminatory ways. I was quite, quite shocked. So WHO has really pushed about stigma and discrimination are never okay. And diseases can affect anyone. And you may remember at the very beginning that the, the, the North European and North American media outlets um, started using these posters um, where they talked about monkeypox happening in North America, Europe and Australia, and yet portraying pictures of, of Africans with monkeypox, I guess, because that's what they said they could get access to. But again, it's a way, it's a kind of discrimination uh, as, as well. And there was a lot of criticism that people should be using representative people from, from their countries. And further discrimination happened once we started the intradermal vaccination program because uh, this, a lot of the patients have been left with, with red marks uh, on their forearms. And we were encouraged to do it in the forearm in Australia. Um, and this is one patient who had his two monkey, monkey pox or mpox uh, vaccinations on the August the 12th and the September the 15th, you can see there. And so almost it's kind of stigmatizing for people as well with this, this particular mark. So. And that's kind of continued. And there was a lot of debate about, you know, is this a new sexually transmitted infection? Well, I would call it a sexually transmissible infection, i.e. it's not the main route generally for, monk for MPOX to be spread, but um, it certainly can spread through a sexual route. And um, so, so in a similar way, things like Zika and so forth, which we wouldn't really regard as a, as a true STI. 
But, you know, coming with the term SGI comes more stigma and discrimination as well. So that was a lot of debate. Very interesting for us in, in my field. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it. MPOX, I guess, for, as a sexual health physician, the sort of things that we, we might see. We didn't see that much in Australia, but thankfully there's been lots of really good papers coming out with good pictures, which I'm going to share with you. I do apologize in advance because obviously all my pictures are relating to the genitalia, sometimes the mouth. Um, so you just have to uh, bear, get through these few slides if you had your lunch. Um, it's probably the best time to have had it before you came to, uh, to, to, the, to the talk. So here we've got uh, the classical MPOX, uh, you, for example, you'd see in, in the Nigeria or the, or the Congo DRC type uh, um, outbreaks. Uh, at the top and then down below some of these uh, newer cases that we were seeing the recent outbreak affecting you know you know the americas the european region particularly and, and australia and what we saw was uh, in amongst these uh, the, our patients was a much less pro prodrome than we would than we would have seen based on reports from from africa uh, and sometimes it, the prodrome was even absent and there were a lot of these genital and perigenital and perianal lesions. And often there were just very few lesions, maybe even down to just one lesion. Most cases were mild, but there were quite severe cases, uh, and particularly in the immunocompromised uh, people living with HIV, and some of them ended up in hospital. Those in hospital quite often had uh, severe rectal infections, which were very painful for them. And they did quite a lot of analgesia. Um, and... Um, you know, from our point of view, it cl can closely mimic other STIs, molluscum, contagiosum, for example, herpes, um, potentially chancroid, that's very rare now, syphilis, and obviously uh, herpes and uh, varicella zoster virus. So um, we're always having to think about that. We were very lucky. We've got a very good lab where we are. So we had a multiplex uh, NAT, NAT test set up very quickly that would do herpes, VZV, and uh, MPOX uh, testing all in one very quickly for us. Um, and uh, we had a good service. So we could we could kind of manage the few patients that came through the door. But we did have to have a low level of suspicion because some of the lesions were very uh, atypical. And bear in mind, you know, none of us had really seen any MPOX before in our lives. So in terms of the male, male presentations, these are pictures from, from various uh, articles in the journals. This one's this uh, pic set of pictures comes from the paper in the Lancet by Taran Vincenti et al. And you can see here lesions, obviously the suprapubic area, the tongue, some lesions there on the wrist and uh, the palm on the body, uh, around the anus, the mouth and the cheek, uh, the tonsils and uh, on the foreskin. And you know you could also see some of these uh, anorectal lesions, um, some perianal on the first picture, but also just inside the anus. And then further down with the uh, proctoscopy, you, you could see that these small ulcerated areas up into the up into the um, colon. Uh, and also uh, the number C there is also inside uh, the gastrointestinal tract. And then the bottom one just is a series of pictures over time, just showing a, a nipple infection, again, from sexual practice and biting of nipples and spreading of MPOX. And there was a cellulitis attached to the, the, the first picture, which was treated with antibiotics, followed by gradual resolution of the MPOX lesion over several days. We, we saw obviously less women um, as I told you, most of the cases have been gained by sexual men, but there has been a very good um, review by Thornhill et al. in The Lancet, published last year, looking at lesions in, in, in women. And uh, again, you can see here these similar sort of um, lesions and again, quite severe um, edema of the, the labia majorum and minorum. There were some novel presentations that have been published. One of them is penile edema. You can see again a time series there in the first set of pictures. And then some very severe infections, which some of these actually cause death. But this uh, in the middle, you can see here secondary bacterial inf infection. Uh, Fournier's gangrene has been described as well. And the one on the uh, right hand side is basically just showing uh, where the arrow is pointing uh, an area of localized uh, perforation. Complications that have been described include skin exfoliation, necrotizing soft tissue infection, severe dehydration, sepsis, 
septic shock. The picture here shows uh, encephalitis. This was a case report by Pastula et al. Um, showing in, in the first picture there, um, the right and frontal lobes, you can see the lesions marked by A, and where the second picture B is the bilateral basal ganglia, and then C is the medial thalami and the, also the right uh, splenium. And then also pyomyositis, cervical lymphadenopathy as per the picture, ocular lesions, you can see there, pneumonia and acute respiratory distress syndrome. So in terms of the management, obviously um, there's very much symptomatic management. Most of the patients we, we saw or know of in Sydney were managed at home. A few did need admission to the infectious diseases unit. Um, generally, they were the patients that would receive some antiviral treatment. Obviously, we, it's important to screen for other STIs, um, and so several patients did have co-infections. Um, prevent uh, complications is, is, is critical, so making sure you don't get secondary infection. Um, infection control, public health, very, very important. Um, and there was a lot, a lot of uh, issues at the beginning. People didn't really know how long to isolate people for. People were told, that certainly in Sydney, they had to stay at home for three whole weeks and not go out. And that was really very difficult uh, for them with their work and their jobs and also, you know, how they get, go out to do their shopping. A lot of the gay bisexual men don't have a big family around them. So, so, so that was quite a challenge. Contact tracing and management, public health were heavily involved in doing a lot of that. Um, and uh, the patient follow-up, making sure patients don't get worse so they, in case they need to go to hospital. And then, of course, vaccination came along a bit later for, for, for contacts. In terms of the treatment, I'm sure you're aware of TPOX and you may or may not have had cases. I expect you've had a few cases at, uh, at uh, your hospital in Grotus Shure, but um, uh, basically this one was approved uh, in 2018 by the FDA. As you know, it can be oral or IV in terms of formulation. Uh, and the study, the FDA approval came based on studies in non-human primates that were infected with MPOX. There are a couple of trials ongoing at the moment, one in the US looking at uh, adults and children with MPOX from the current outbreak. And there's another study called the PALM trial, which is in adults and children with MPOX in the DRC. And Tambexa, Tambexa or uh, Brincidivir, Sidofavir, sorry, is um, another FDA approved uh, oral formulation. Um, that came around in 2021. There was some animal data from rabbit pox virus infections in rabbits and also some mice infections with ectromelia virus. So, um, but less uh, use of that particular agent. Really in my clinic, we didn't really get involved in doing any treatments, but what we did do was a lot of vaccinations. So the Genius vaccine came along. Um, other, in some countries it's known as Invernex or Invermune, um, as you all probably aware. It's a modified Vaccinia ankara, Bavarian Nordic uh, orthopox uh, that, that's a live vaccine, but it's weakened and it doesn't replicate. Because it's grown in a chick embryo, chicken embryo fibroblast cells, and there's some gentamicin and ciprofloxacin around, it's always important to check out for allergies to those particular agents. Um, and uh, traditionally, uh, we started off with the intradermal route. Um, in fact, actually, we started with subcutaneous route to begin with at 0.5 mils, but then there was a problem that we didn't have enough supply. So then we had to start using the, the intradermal route so that one vial, 1.5 mil vial could be split into five. We'd get five people vaccinated. So that's when the intradermal uh, vaccinations in the forearm began. But uh, we soon realized, uh, uh, certainly within New South Wales, that it was going to cause a lot of problems for, for uh, people with these lesions from the vaccination that wouldn't get go away. So we ended up starting to do it uh, up over the deltoid. And I know in the US it's quite popular to do it um, under the shoulder blade in the upper back. Subcutaneous injections, uh, we're back kind of giving those again now and in the upper arm, usually over the, over the triceps. And certainly these are very important if there's a history of keloid. So if you're having uh, some of your black skinned patients there, it's really, really important that you check a history of keloid scarring. Um, as you know, it's two doses recommended 28 days apart, but if you've had smallpox vaccination before, you, you only need to have one. If that was more than 10 years ago, for which for most of us it would be. Um, and uh, 
Um, basically, what the, the concept, I think, and understanding at the moment is that both routes of uh, vaccination are equally effective, but we lack an immune correlate. So that makes it difficult to really be sure about protection. And the length of protection is really unknown. So there's a lot more work that needs to be done. So that's just a quick run through MPOX from, from the sexual health uh, viewpoint. And I want to talk a little bit more about doxy PEP or post-exposure prophylaxis now. So in terms of uh, antimicrobial prophylaxis for STIs, um, this is not so much a, a new phenomenon, um, uh, but in the First and Second World War, potassium permanganate irrigations and calam calomel ointment, which contains a mercury derivative, um, uh, were used quite a lot to try and uh, prevent um, syphilis and gonorrhea. And in uh, the 1970s in Vietnam, uh, Australian military were already using doxycycline as STI prophylaxis. And we, we do know that rates of syphilis, chlamydia and gonorrhea, all these bacterial STIs have increased substantially in many countries, uh, perhaps with the caveat that things slowed down a bit during COVID, during the lockdowns because of less testing, but they're certainly on the rise again now. The earliest study uh, of, of recent times to look at uh, antimicrobial prophylaxis for STIs came from Bolin et al. in 20, 2015 in the US. There was a, just a small study of 30 men who have sex with men or MSM with a one-to-one -one randomization of doxycycline, um, 100 milligrams daily versus basically testing and treating of uh, patients at contingency management. Follow-up was almost two years, 48 weeks. And they saw a lower frequency of STIs in the doxycycline arm, which was uh, statistically significant with an odds ratio of 0.27. But this was not powered to assess uh, the effect for individual uh, STIs. A larger study was reported three years later by Molina et al. from France, and that had 232 MSM in it. It was a one-to-one -one randomization of doxycycline, 200 milligrams taken within 24 hours of sex versus standard treatment. Um, and uh, there was 10 months of follow-up. And what they saw was a 70% reduction in first episode of syphilis and a 70% reduction in the first episode of, um, of chlamydia, both obviously significant. But um, there was interesting in this particular study, they saw no reduction in, uh, in gonorrhea. Now, moving on to more recent times, this is data that this paper has just been published in April this year by Lute Khmer et al. From, uh, the, from, from US. But basically, this was an open label randomized study involving uh, men who have sex with men, trans women, on either on HIV prep or living with HIV, uh, who had had gonorrhea, chlamydia, or syphilis in the past 12 months. In total, there were 501 participants. And they were randomized two to one to either take the doxycycline. This was a delayed uh, release uh, tablet formulation, un unlike other of the, of the PEP trials for doxycycline. And that had to be taken within 72 hours of condomless anal sex or they received a standard care, which was basically STI testing performed every three months or whenever they were symptomatic. And obviously if there were any STIs detected, treatment uh, was given. And the primary endpoint was the instance of at least one STI per follow-up quarter. Now this study was stopped early in May, 2022 due to the high efficacy of the intervention as a, after it had been requested by the data monitoring board to have a look at what was going on. They observed a 62 to 66% lower frequency of bacterial STIs in the doxypep versus the standard care arms. The doxypep didn't have any serious adverse effects as you would expect during the 12 months of follow-up since we use a lot of it anyway in syndromic management. We know it's pretty safe as long as you're not pregnant or breastfeeding. Um, but this is obviously a study in, in men, trans women, so, so there weren't really going to be any problems here. Um, amongst those taking the doxycycline, 2% did discontinue due to um, what was described as unacceptable adverse events or patient preference. This is just a table for those of you who like numbers, but basically as well as any STI being significant with a reduction in, in, with a, in the doxypep arm, you can see that for, for the PrEP patients, the, the top part of the, of the table, um, there were also um, significant uh, reductions in any gonorrhea, any chlamydia, and any syphilis. For those living with HIV, which is a smaller 
uh, subset within the study. Again, any gonorrhea, any chlamydia was also significantly reduced, but they didn't get a significant reduction for any syphilis because the numbers were far too small. They did look at uh, AMR detection in this study. So at baseline, 27% uh, of the isolates were reported to be tetracycline resistance. It was a small number of isolates, just 15, and four of them resistant. After enrollment, they did see a difference in the two arms. So 38.5% in the doxypep group had become resistant compared to a reduction in, in the prevalence of resistance of 12.5% um, of those in the standard care arm. They also looked at Staphylococcus aureus. It's obviously important to look at just not S the effect on STIs, but also the effect on other bacteria. And we do know sometimes doxycycline has a role to play in management of MRSA infections. They did, uh, and almost half of the participants, they got Staph aureus isolated at, at baseline, and they saw about 12% tetracycline resistance. At one year, there was less Staph aureus isolated, as you'd expect from the doxypep participants. Only 28% of them um, grew the organism, uh, compared to 47% of the standard care um, group. Um, but tetracycline resistance was, was uh, occurring at a higher prevalence, 16% in the doxypep group compared to 8% in the standard care group. So some evidence already at one year that there was an uh, impact on AMR. So that's that study from the US. And then there's a, also a French AR, ARNS-174, the so-called doxyvax trial that's been uh, recently presented at Croy this year by Melina et al. This was a, a multi-center randomized and open label trial involving MSM, taking HIV PrEP, who had had a bacterial STI in the past uh, 12 months. And the trial was supposed to recruit, the aim was 720. There was a two to one ratio for doxypep versus no pep. And as well as that, the same group of patients were also randomized one to one to receive Bexero or 4C MB vaccine or no vaccine. And there was planned to be up to 96 weeks of follow up. P participants took uh, in the doxy pep arm took 200 milligrams within 72 hours of condylar anal sex. And like other studies, basically STI testing is performed every three months or whenever they were symptomatic. And the primary endpoint again here was the first uh, episode of syphilis, chlamydia, or the impact of. Um, the Bexero vaccine uh, on time to the first episode of Neisseria uh, gonorrhea. The study had to be unblinded. So this unblinding happened after the, uh, the US study data came out and they'd stopped their trial. They felt it was important to have a look at the data in the French study as well. Um, and enrollment was stopped because they saw a clear benefit. So at the time of closure, only 546 um, participants have been randomized. 44 didn't attend any follow-up visits that left 502 participants for which uh, study data could be analyzed. So quite a big study. So there's a whole series of graphs here, but just to sort of give you the, the idea of the picture, it's all pretty much the same. Um, so if we look at the time to first chlamydia or syphilis infection, so either of those two STIs, uh, basically um, they saw there was 49 subjects infected with one or other of these two uh, STIs, 36 in the no pep arm and only 13 in the doxy pep arm. Um, and that was a, a significant uh, adjusted hazard ratio, as you can see there, of 0.16. So a big reduction in, in the um, doxypep uh, group. When you look at the infections on their own, so the first graph on the left is chlamydia, the other one on the right is syphilis. It's the same sort of pattern, again, with very uh, significant reductions in the adjusted hazard ratio there, 0.11 and 0.21. For gonorrhea and, and mycoplasma genitalia, they also looked, but you, you see that again, significant um, reductions. But if you look at the adjusted hazard ratios, they are a little bit higher. So not quite as much impact as you saw with chlamydia and, uh, and syphilis. Then they looked at the resistance. So amongst the patients in the trial, um, or hundred percent of the isolates that they did get at the beginning at baseline, it wasn't a lot, it was seven, um, had resistance at, at basically one milligram per liter or higher. But so it's low level 
um, tetracycline resistance. But when they looked at um, follow-up, um, the doxycycline PEP versus the no PEP uh, groups, you can see the red bars there relate to the high level tetracycline resistant uh, gonococcal strains, otherwise known as TRNGs. And these have MICs of 60 milligrams per liter or above. Uh, and there was quite a substantial um, increase despite the numbers not being massive uh, in the uh, doxy PEP. Um, suggesting that's got that this is a new mechanism resistance and it's been selected for by the use of the tetracycline. They didn't see anything in terms of the uh, chlamydia because most of the chlamydia in the doxy pep arm uh, didn't occur. They're very just very small numbers of chlamydia cases in, in, in the doxy pep group. They had very few of those uh, particular strains to look at it when they did a culture work to determine if there was any. Uh, resistance phenotypically or else by looking at 16S ribosome or RNA sequencing. The microbiome was also looked at. Um, so they looked at MRSA detected in throat swabs in the top part of that, uh, that graph there. And you can see that uh, by month 12, there was starting to appear to be a difference with, with slightly higher proportion of participants in the uh, doxy pep arm having MRSA detected compared to the no pep arm. And also when you look at the ESBL E. coli in the anal swabs, again, um, just slight hint that things are a little bit worse off in the uh, doxy pep um, arm. In terms of uh, self-reported adherence, of course, self-reported adherence is always a challenge because you don't know how accurate it is, but it's about 80% basically all the way through the month. The median time to taking the PEP, the doxy PEP was 27 hours after sex. And uh, most the average or the median uh, number of pills per month was seven uh, and three did discontinue it um, due to, as you can see, their gastrointestinal side effects or fear of side effects. When they looked at the time to first gonococcal infection for the patients who received the um, the Bexero vaccine, again, they saw a, a similar reduction uh, to what they saw with the doxypep. Of, and this time the adjusted hazard ratio was 0.49. Again, significant, 32 cases in the no vaccine arm and 17 cases in the Bexero arm. And remember that was a one-to-one -one, um, randomization. But they didn't actually get significance when they looked at the cumulative incidence of gonococcal infections throughout the, the period of the study until it got stopped. Um, uh, and that's really demonstrated here. It just missed significance at 0 0.052. And the error bar, the upper 95% confidence interval was one. Then the third study that was presented again this year at Croy was actually among women. And this one took place in Kenya and Kasumu between 2020 to 2022. And uh, the, it's a good place to do this study because there's high STI rates and high prevalence antimicrobial resistant uh, gonorrhea. And they recruited 449 non-pregnant cisgender women. The target was actually going to be 464, but they got to 449 when they presented uh, the data. Uh, randomization to doxycycline 200 milligrams after sex versus standard care. And again, the same standard care as the other studies, three monthly STI screening and treatment is needed. They had weekly texts that were sent to the, the women to assess frequency of sex and a frequency of, of doxycycline use each week. In terms of baseline characteristics of women in this study, the median age was 50, uh, well, sorry, was 24 years of age and the median duration of HIV PrEP use was seven months. 60% were using hormonal contraception, 37% of the women were involved in transactional sex. 18% had bacterial STIs, most commonly chlamydia, that was 14%, and 4% were gonorrhea and less than 1% had syphilis. The survey response was pretty good. It was 81% overall. Uh, there were 80 pregnancies uh, during uh, this uh, study. And doxycycline is obviously suspended in the intervention group. That was 44 women um, when that happened. The annual instance during the course of the study was, was still high at 27%. Um, they found, again, doxycycline very well tolerated and safe. 
in in their hands and no adverse uh, adverse reactions. Four women interestingly reported social harms, which were mainly verbal and or physical uh, abuse. Now, unlike the studies in MSM transgender uh, women, um, when this study was done in cisgender women, there was absolutely no no uh, significant findings at all. So, there, doxycycline didn't reduce the risk of STIs, and the relative risk ratio was 0.88. And you can see there, 95% confidence intervals spreading over one. Um, so that was true for risk of any STIs, risk of gon gonorrhea, or risk of uh, chlamydia. They couldn't analyze it for syphilis because there was only one case of syphilis that occurred during follow-up. So there was a lot of talk at Croy, uh, and there's been a lot of talk subsequently about why this intervention failed. Um, the doxycycline resistant gonorrhea cases were small numbers, uh, but they did increase from six at baseline to 22 at follow-up. They didn't do any work up on the chlamydia um, susceptibilities, but their assumption was, and I think it's a reasonable one, that there was not to be expected any chlamydia resistance since we don't have any documented clinical resistance worldwide. You can get heterotypic resistance in the laboratory, but it, it's not the same as having a clinical treatment failure in, in a patient. Um, so there's been a big debate as to whether the drug levels may have been different in the endocervical tissue compared to, for example, urethral, rectal, or pharyngeal sites. And there's also been some questions about the self-reported adherence, which was reportedly high, but was it high enough or was it actually accurate? There's one more study that was presented at Croy, which I think kind of adds a little bit of interest into the previous study in, in women in from Kenya. This was a small ph uh, pharmacokinetic study that undertaken in the US with 20 participants, 11 men and nine women. Median age was 38 for the men and 34 years for the women. These uh, participants received a single dose of doxypep 200 milligrams, and then they provided blood and mucosal swabs for seven days after the doxycycline was given. Uh, they had biopsies taken from the rectum, vagina, and cervix, and urethral swabs also were collected 24 hours after dosing. dosing. And they looked at the plasma, rectal, vaginal uh, PK values evaluated over seven days, and the time to the CMAX differed by, by uh, various um, anatomical areas. So for example, in compartments, plasma was four hours, vagina was eight hours, and the rectum was 48 hours. They also looked at the CMAX levels in the mucosal tissues, and they saw that they peaked over five times that required for the doxycycline MIC for chlamydia and syphilis, and remained at more than four times the doxycycline MIC for over 48 hours. In contrast for, for gonorrhea, because gonorrhea has higher MICs uh, for doxycycline, levels were only reached um, for over four times over the MIC for 11 hours in the vaginal tissue, and the levels weren't reached at all in the rectal tissue. So it does look like this is a, an area where there's going to need to be quite a lot more work to, to really understand if this is going to be a strategy that could be applied uh, for, for women at high risk of uh, STIs. This is another um, study that was presented at Croy, and this was, was to look at the impact. How can you better uh, improve your impact of your doxy PEP while at the same time trying to reduce the damage to antimicrobial resistance? So it's, it's a question of trying to what, what's the best uh, trade-off and the best approach. And this was a study that was uh, presented by Michael Traeger et al. And he, he was working over in Boston with Jonathan Grad and looked at the electronic healthcare records from the Fenway Health System. There was data available for over 10 and a half thousand participants over five years, uh, uh, looked at doxycycline prescriptions and outcomes, and basically equated to over 28,000 person years of follow up. And they looked at 10 potential doxypep strategies, which you can look at if you like in the in the paper. But um, one of the key ones was, was you can see some of them in the graphs here, but the key finding was basically that if you gave doxypep for one year and following an STI diagnosis in a patient, that would reduce the subsequent STI cases by 42%. And that was deemed to be the most efficient strategy and much more efficient than just prescribing doxypep to all um, people who use PrEP to prevent HIV acquisition. 
and and they're a bit fuzzy, so I apologize for that. But the the, the little bar charts here basically showing that uh, you got the best bang for your buck um, in uh, the categories of two STIs in 12 months or two STIs in six months or just a, a concurrent STI in the top one. That's for chlamydia. And the same was true for gonorrhea. And the Y uh, axis is basically looking at the number of uh, patients needed to be treated to avoid one STI case um, in a year. So um, for syphilis, what the critical thing here is, is someone who's had syphilis already has got syphilis. Now they're the ones who are much more higher risk of getting syphilis again. And so that actually became the most important uh, strategy for doxypep for, for, for those patients. And you actually get quite a big benefit um, if, you, uh, if you hit that particular group of patients and, and offer them this strategy. So at the moment, uh, you know, WHO is also struggling with, you know, how are we going to um, rec make recommendations and so forth for doxypep? Um, and I've been in the guideline meetings this week and, and um, you know, PICO questions are being designed and we'll probably get some more information towards the end of the year. Um, but you'll see quite a lot of change in the next 12 months, I believe. So what are the potential risks of doxypep? Well, first of all, is the escalation of antimicrobial res resistance in STIs. Escalation of antimicrobial resistance in other non-STI bacteria, obviously very important for you in infectious diseases, effects on the human microbiome. And the challenges for us today are people already using doxypep. And this is just a post, and I, do, I think this is probably in the US, uh, but we get a lot of these in Australia as well, and, you know, very much aimed at the community that uh, men who have sex with men. This one's saying, take a load, take a dose. Doxypep, make your night, make it your last load of the night. So, you know, we've got that side of things working at the moment. So people are using it. We need to balance, I think, gr growing consumer expectations with antimicrobial stewardship. We need guidelines because they're desperately missing at the moment. Um, and we're at the very early stages of getting those drawn up and how best to regulate the provision of antimicrobials in society. So in the remaining uh, few minutes, I wanted just to switch over and talk a bit more about vaccines to prevent gonococcal infection. So there have been um, a lot of challenges to gonococcal vaccine development. First problem is the variability in the surface exposed antigens, and that's because of the natural transformation, the antigenic variation and the phase variation that occurs in this organism. It's really the master of escaping the immune system. And we know that adaptive immune responses to highly conserved antigens don't protect against subsequent infection. One of the problems is that you get these blocking antibodies developed, uh, antibodies aiming uh, against the RMP or pro protein uh, three uh, protein that sits on the outside of the organism. And, and these antibodies bind and block and they prevent other antibodies, the bactericidal antibodies from actually doing their damage. Um, and they can't really bind onto the poor B or the LOS, which are the, the targets of those bactericidal antibodies. The immune correlates for protection remain poor. So that's always a challenge in vaccine development. And there's a lack of robust animal models to study this pathogen, which is an obligate human pathogen. There have been some vaccine experiments in human beings. The first one in the early 1900s, there was a prophylactic wholesale vaccine that was used in an attempt to treat gonorrhea cases. Greenberg et al. used a partially autolyzed crude wholesale vaccine to immunize Canadian Inuits in uh, 1974. Boslego et al. from the US tested a gonococcal pillus vaccine in an experimental infection in a large scale field trial of the US military, and Tremont reported gonococcal protein one, which is known as POR A, a vaccine uh, challenge study in the context of human experimental uh, infection. But the result of all of these was unfortunately a big failure, nothing, nothing worked. So there, a lot of uh, people just gave up uh, until what happened was the outer membrane vesicle vaccine started to emerge. And so there were some field observations, in, which I think are useful to look back historically. First one was in Cuba, where there was eco ecological evidence to support a decline in gonorrhea after a nationwide outer membrane vesicle vaccine campaign in the 1980s to, to reduce uh, meningococcal disease. 
with the, the vaccine that's listed there. Uh, and also in Norway, they had a, an MBVAC that uh, was based on outer membrane vesicles that, that took place at that trial amongst teenagers from 1988 to 1992. But they, they did see a fall in gonorrhea rates afterwards, but the, the rates were falling anyway. So it was quite hard to interpret that data. But nonetheless, these are sort of clues that maybe outer membrane vesicle approaches might be helpful. Um, so the thing about outer membrane vesicle vaccines is they're only really useful against meningococcal epidemics dominated by strains with the same boring group or zero subtype. And there was one uh, outer membrane vesicle called, uh, we call MenZB, um, which was uh, developed in uh, New Zealand to control a hypervirulent uh, meningococcal clone that caused a lot of disease uh, several years ago. Um, once the outbreak was controlled with this uh, kind of homemade vaccine, it was no longer produced. Um, what we do know as well is that there's about 80% genetic homology in primary DNA sequence between meningo and cocci and uh, gonococci. And most uh, virulence factors have equivalence in both uh, species. In New Zealand, about 1 million individuals, that's 81% uh, of the over 20 year olds, received almost 3 million doses of this vaccine over two years. And the beauty in New Zealand is they also have data, a registry on who's had chlamydia and who's had gonorrhea in, in, in the country. So the chlamydia is important because it's the control because you wouldn't expect the, the vaccine to have any impact there. And then they could look at see, was there any effect on gonorrhea cases once the vaccination program had taken place? So this provided an opportunity to study the hypothesis. And then the real uh, groundbreaking paper came out from uh, Helen Petusas Harris and colleagues published in The Lancet in 2017, looking at this uh, particular Group B uh, outer membrane vesicle vaccine in New Zealand. And what they saw was a 31% protective effect against gonorrhea in adults aged 15 to 30. And they were very pleased to see the same um, protection at 31% in the Maoris, making sure there was equity within their country. They didn't see any significant effect of partial vaccination due to low statistical power. Uh, and there didn't appear to be any difference between the sexes on the adjusted model, but uh, the basic figures showed uh, slightly higher back vaccine effectiveness in women compared to men. Now, we know that there are 22 major proteins that comprise over 90% of the men's ZB uh, outer membrane vesicle content. And poor A is the immunodominant antigen there and the target of the bactericidal antibodies that protect against a meningitis. And as I mentioned before, poor A is a very important uh, um, target for bactericidal antibodies in, in gonorrhea, but just the antibodies can't get there because of the RMP blocking antibodies. So what happened was after the men's ZB uh, uh, vaccine was, was discontinued within New Zealand, um, GSK utilized it to, to be part of the Bexero or 4C MenB vaccine, vaccine. So on top of the that, that uh, strain from New Zealand and the outer membrane vesicles that were made from it, they also uh, added three recombinant antigens. So there's the Neisseria heparin binding antigen that's fused to GNA11030 and the factor H binding protein that's bound to another uh, protein in a fusion type approach, um, GNA2091, and then there's the Niceroidesin A. Now of these, the important ones are probably the, the NHBA, because we know that's uh, encoded, and the two uh, GNA proteins that are part of the fusion proteins. The, the uh, factor H binding protein in the gonococcus isn't surface exposed, unlike uh, meningococci, and there is no gene for NADA in gonococci. But it was thought that this, this would be better, probably a, a better effect than um, would be seen with, um, uh, with, the, with, the, with the previous MenZB in New Zealand. So there's been a couple more observation studies using the Bexera vaccine. They were published uh, just last year. So the first one basically was in New York and, and Philadelphia, and they had mat matched health records to immunization records in a similar way to what they could have done in New Zealand. 
They had uh, over 167,000 infections in almost 110,000 people. You can see the numbers. Most of it was chlamydia, but there was a lot of gonorrhea infections as well and co-infections. And nearly, uh, well, over 7,500 people had re received Bexera vaccine and over half of them was one dose, just under half was two doses and just a few, for some reason, received more than two doses. Um, so they compared the prevalence of gonorrhea or gonococcal infections during the vaccinated periods with the prevalence during the unvaccinated periods. And what they estimated was that two doses of Bexera provided 40% 40% protection against uh, gonorrhea, and one dose provided 26% protection. A similar study done in, in South Australia, again, looking at Bexera vaccinations in adolescents and young people, this one basically suggested that, that two doses of Bexera were 33% effective against gonorrhea in these, uh, this young population. So we're involved, uh, we're one of the centres involved in, in a multi-centre study at the moment in Australia. It's a randomised controlled trial to compare Bexera vaccine with a salo, uh, saline placebo. This is phase three double-blinded uh, randomised placebo-controlled trial. Um, and the target population for us is 18 to 15-year-old men, cis or trans, and trans women or non-binary people have sex with men. And... Uh, participants either have to be on PrEP at the beginning or else living with HIV with reasonable CD4 count and a viral load that's less than 200. The aim was to enroll 730 targets, but we, because of COVID, the study ran into a bit of trouble like many did. And so we had to stop enrollment just recently. We had about 660 participants, just around that number, that were enrolled. Um, and uh, we'll be following them up. The good news is that the um, instance of gonor gonorrhea at the moment is much higher than, than we had anticipated. And so when the uh, sample size calculations were done, uh, it was with a lower incidence rate. So we, we, we anticipate we will get a good result and we'll have that in about a couple of years. So what about the impact of uh, gonococcal vaccines? Well. Uh, the group I work with, we, we kind of looked at uh, maths and mathematical modeling that was done by Ben Huey and uh, David Regan over at the Kirby Institute at University of New South Wales. And they looked at uh, the, using their model to see if they could uh, simulate a gonococcal infection in a population of 10,000 MSM. Um, basically, to cut a long story short, if 30% of the MSM are vaccinated on presentation for STI testing, if you had a, a vaccine that had 100% protective efficacy, you could reduce gonorrhea prevalence by 94% within two years. If your vaccine was only 50% protective efficacy, it's a little bit higher than what's been suggested with the Bexera, but not much higher, you could get a 62% um, reduction in gonococcal prevalence within two years. And it is possible to eliminate um, gonorrhea within eight years with vaccines of 50% or higher efficacy, providing a boost is given every uh, three years and the efficacy lasts at least two years. Um, what we don't know is, you know, will the vaccine impact be effective at all anatomical sites? We weren't able to, that's too early for us to be able to know that. And this was just modeling. There's been some recent modelling in the UK as well uh, to look at economic costs as well. This is quite interesting. We're looking at the use of Bexero. They looked at three vaccination approaches for MSM, uh, vaccinating all of the MSM attending the sexual health services, just vaccinating those who had a confirmed gonorrhea diagnosis and vaccinating those who um, were thought to have high risk of infection. And basically, the, the long story, or cut the long story short, is that the Bexero vaccination of MSM at highest risk of gonococcal infection was the best strategy. And they reckon they could uh, prevent 110,000 cases and save over $8 million over 10 years. And of course, the cost saving, the cost effectiveness analysis are really important if you're going to provide a um, impetus for policy change in, in the country with something like vaccination program. So Mark, that's, I'm at the end now. Um, so I hope those are, I think they probably are the three biggest hot topics in sexual health at the moment, but there are other ones uh, always brewing up in the background. Thanks. Fantastic, David. That was really a, a, a marvelous overview of three of these major topics. And thank you, incredible. I'm sure there are questions. Perhaps if you could stop sharing um, yep. Green. That would be fantastic. 
Um, if uh, colleagues do have questions, could you raise hand? And perhaps Sean, you could um, you could control the hand raising for the the room. David, um, two questions from my side. In the deep prep study, um, you mentioned that the median delay to taking Dr. Cyclin was 27 hours after sex, which is quite a time. Was there any sub-analysis and reduction um, in further reduction if it was taken, you know, at a much shorter duration after sex? So I'm I'm not aware of that yet, Mark, but I'm I'm sure they will have that data and they may well be able to look into that. I mean, this was data that's only really just come out a few months ago at Croy in, in abstract. So we still need to see the papers. Um, but uh, but but yes, but if you look at the the data, the pharmacokinetic study was quite interesting because you know it does tell you that that for certainly for chlamydia and syphilis, um, the doxycycline does hang around at reasonably good levels for quite a period of time. The problem is with the gonorrhea, uh, levels were not great in the in the rectum. Right. Rectal okay. tissue. So the other, uh, my other question was around the modeling for the of the vaccine efficacy. Has there been any modeling around what they think the effect may have on HIV transmission with a reduction in gonorrhea cases? I haven't seen it, but things have changed now because of TASP and treatment as prevention. So, you, I mean, maybe a little bit different in Africa, but certainly in Australia, um, you know, most of our HIV, um, people infected with HIV in Australia are actually on treatment and are, most of those are undetectable. So we, for, for us to, to do it in a country like Australia or in the US, it would be quite difficult because, um, you, you know, the, the, the risk of getting infected, even if you have sex with someone who's got HIV is, is really very, very low now. But I guess that, you know, that would be a good study to do in Africa. Yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, I don't think that's quite the case case yet here. So there's a um, there's a yeah. hand raised in the meeting room. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Th thanks, David. It's short speaking. That was a really wonderful talk. Um, I've got a question about um, the resistance issue. And maybe I missed this, but the, the, the difference in resistance among the black pathogens and the staph aureus was that detected at the end of the study period, so at the end of the PrEP period, or was there a follow-up after stopping discontinuing PrEP in that group? And so I'm really asking about persistence of resistance. Um, yeah, in the exactly. And I think this is the big issue because many of us don't think you're going to see much resistance within <laughs> a year. And this is going to take several years to show. Uh, and, and so long, longer data is really important. But basically, um, the, the data has just been put into abstracts and presented at Croy. Um, and only one of those papers got published. Uh, that was in just a couple of months ago. That was the one from the US. Um, so so uh, I don't think we, 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 we've got the long, long term data yet uh, in those particular patients. And presumably, they're going to continue to take, take it. I mean, San Francisco now. Um, certainly you can get DoxyPet. They're actually providing it in their clinics. So uh, that it's, that's, it'll be a great place to be able to look into that sort of thing. But, but I think a lot of us are concerned because, you know, the, the messages that we're hearing is, oh, it's really good. It reduces STIs. And look, there's not that much resistance of a problem. So it's going to be okay at small numbers. But, you know, those of us that have worked in AMR for a long time, I see Mark smiling, but I mean, we know it takes years, several years for you to see changes. But once things take off, they take off big time. And we've seen that in many organisms with many antibiotics. So I, I think um, it's, it's, I, it's akin to opening Pandora's box, right? Yeah, I didn't. I, I put that picture there for a reason. It's and and so we have this argument because you know you know you go into a room and talk about it. That, that a lot of people can't see that AMR will not happen in five minutes. It's going to take time. Um, commensals are going to get mutations, and then you're going to get, for example, a gonococcus sitting next to a commensal in the throat will then pick up something. So this will take a long time. The gut as well. And, you know, there's many more organisms they probably should be looking at. Microbiome, we hardly know anything. Yeah. So. so, I mean, so people, yeah, sorry, sorry. I mean, so, I mean, you mentioned about the microbiome. I mean, has there been a, a resistome analysis in any of these trials? There's one plan. 
Not yet, but it will be planned, I'm sure. They've got the date. Uh, they've certainly taken the samples, as you saw in the, in the French study, uh, to look at it. So people know they need to look at it, but it's still in the, in the research uh, phase. Thanks. But while all this is going on, we're getting all this push from the community, right, to, to, get, um, to get everybody onto Doxypep now. So <laughs> we're trying to struggle with all of this. Uh, it's, it's very challenging. So we've got a, um, we've got a, a question from Remco, Remco Peters. Um, hi, David. <laughs> Thanks for a great talk as usual. Um, I wonder if you could comment on um, the context of diagnostics and, and doxypep, um, whether it's over-the-counter use or uh, programmatic use of doxypep um, and the need for diagnostic testing for STIs. Yeah, so diagnostic testing obviously is going to be really, really important for screening for STIs. Um, but if you don't have diagnostic tests, as is the case, for example, in much of Africa, you're left with nothing. So this is when these sort of um, biomedical interventions, PPT or doxy, doxypep really can take a hold. And then it becomes really difficult how you're going to police it. And is it just going to be pulled out for everybody? And obviously, it's not going to be give, at the moment. There's no no evidence to suggest it's going to be of any benefit in women. So there need to be a lot more studies looking at at women um, at, at high risk of STI. So getting the diagnostics better is really really important. And you know, being able to monitor what's happening with doxycycline resistance is, is important. But but as you know yourself, I mean, the number of labs in Africa, for example, that actually doing regular AMR testing is really, really small. A few in the private sector, I'm sure, but not for like surveillance programs. So that's an issue. Over the counter, I mean, that would be the worst nightmare for, for, for me, I think, probably you too. <laughs> but that's what it's pushing. The internet is another big site. Uh, people want to, where they're getting their, a lot of people getting their, their prep, HIV prep on the internet now. Um, with the prescription. Doxycycline is so cheap as well. Um, and I know when I worked in, in Joburg, I mean, I sent one of my, my, my staff out just because I'd heard something to Alexandra and they just came back with a stop drop, it was called, and it was just doxycycline packets that they just bought over the, from the pharmacy, even though there's supposed to be regulations for antibiotic use. So, I mean, even in South Africa where you've got regulation, it's not always working. Um, and many of the countries don't have anything like that. It's all sold over the market. So it's going to be a problem. And you don't actually know what's in these pills some of the time, right? So some of it's not, not you know, the, the kosher stuff or some of it's just, um, you know, weak concentrations of doxycycline. And then that just generates more problems too. But once the, the tetracycline resistance, uh, there it's on a plasmid. So once that starts to develop and you saw it in one of those studies, those dark red bars, once that starts to emerge, they spread really quickly plasmid mediated uh, um, mechanisms of resistance like happened with penicillinase producing gonococci. And, and, and they'll just pass through conjugation tubes from gonococcus to gonococcus. So, so um, that, that it's really difficult to, to hold back uh, plasmid mediated mechanisms of resistance. So that's gonna be an easy way forward. And there are issues, right? Because um, if you have doxycycline resistance, quite often one of the resistance mechanisms at the lower level is actually derepressing the efflux pump of that organism. So the MTR, um, you know, the repressor gets uh, turned uh, off and it, the, pump, the pump starts working again. And so the outer membrane pump pushes out, not just uh, tetracyclines from the outer, uh, from, from the periplasmic space, but it'll also pump out cephalosporins and also uh, penicillins and macrolides. And so you're gonna end up having rate, rises in MICs in all of these classes of antibiotics against the gonococcus. And for me, the biggest problem is what's gonna to happen to keftriaxone, because if we actually make things worse there by inducing more and more MTR mutations, it will be a problem. A lot of the, the, the reason a lot of the men who have sex with men have got resistant strains already is because they do have MTR mutations because uh, that, that, that's needed really to live for those organisms to live in the rectum because it's a very hydrophobic environment. And so they actually got to pump all the rubbish out as well. And so they de-repress their pumps. And so that's why you see a lot of chromosomal resistance to penicillin, to, 
to, to tetracyclines in, in strains from MSM is much higher than, for example, women, heterosexual women or heterosexual men. But once you start giving doxypep to everybody, we're going to see that for everyone. So, David, does just, that answer your question? I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I think it's fine now, David. It was, it was about um, treatment of, of prevalent infections, basically, but it's covered things. Yep. David, just a, a final quick question. In the, in the studies for AMR that they were doing in the French study, I didn't see pharyngeal swaps being taken. Is that correct? It was rectal. Um, Is it I'll just have to, yeah, just let me remind the, myself. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, that's one of the yeah, big were, questions, isn't it, in terms of the pharyngeal carriage. Absolutely. Resistance. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, no, they on. they went basically for 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 chlamydia and syphilis, but they did look at gonorrhea. So so they would have taken samples, I think, from all sites for that. Um, yeah, I didn't present anything by site, but I think it would have been all the sites because the MSM because about th third to forty 